it is well. We're continuing in Luke, just like you expected. Of course, we are repositioning ourselves. If you've been with us for a while, talking to you here in the sanctuary, you online this morning, if you've been with us following along uh, through our sermon series since September, we've been reading the Gospel of Luke, and we will so until next September, till we read every word of it. And we took a break during Lent and into Easter to look at Holy Week and the Resurrection. And so we are truly, fully aware of what happened to Jesus and what it means to be a resurrection people following an ascended Lord. Amen? Amen. And so now we are looking back to where we left off when we were going really slow. And we're back in chapter 9. So if you brought your Bible with you today, or you've got one there on your laptop uh, or in your device, I invite you to take a look at it before I read. um, Let us pray. Oh Lord, this is a time of great provision where we come to you and you give us what we need through your word. And so Lord, would by your Holy Spirit, these words come into our hearts into our minds, into our very lives. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This reading today is Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 17. There's essentially three main parts. The first part is the twelve leaving on a journey. Those twelve originally had been called by Jesus in chapter 6, you might recall. And then there's a little bit of a pause where we see what's going on with Herod, the leader of that area. And then the third part is the twelve returning from their journey to see what happens. Beginning at verse 1. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, Take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, leave their town and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. That's part one. Now part two. Now Herod, the Tetrarch, we also know him as Herod Antipas, heard about all that was going on, and he was perplexed because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead, others that Elijah had appeared, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? And he tried to see him. That's part two. Now part three. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He, Jesus, welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so that they can go into the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging, because we are in a remote place here. Jesus replied, You give them something to eat. They answered, We have only five loaves of bread and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all this crowd. Huh. About 5,000 men were there. 
But Jesus said to his disciples, Have them sit down in groups of about fifty each. The disciples did so, and everyone sat down, taking the five loaves and the two fish. And looking to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. And he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. May God add this blessing to this reading of his holy word. Amen. We see in the Gospels, whenever there are disciples of Jesus, that there's kind of a two-part rhythm of discipleship and ministry. There's this, sin, this uh, thing that Jesus does to call them to him, and we understand that as Jesus summons. Verse 1 It says, when Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. Jesus calls. We kind of understand that. If we've been paying attention for a while, we don't know that's part of what he does. He summons us to him. He summoned the disciples to them. The word disciple means learner, and so they were there partly to learn, but also to grow in how they understood him and knew him as a friend, as as the boss, as a rabbi. He had previously called these twelve to him, so they had followed him around, kind of gotten to know him a little bit, his personality, but now he had something else in store for them, and so he wasn't just calling them to be with him, he was calling them together, summoning them to do something to them, to give them something. And my sense is, my my understanding is that this was a beginning for these disciples of learning what it would be to follow him and to live in a certain lifestyle for the rest of their lives. This would become a way of life for them. And so what did he do? He gave them power and authority. Now, in today's world, we don't trust power and authority. It's been something that we either think it's something to be grabbed and kind of held on to as a privilege ourselves, or it's something to be suspicious of when others have it. But in this sense, this is Jesus' power and authority given to his disciples because it's something that they will need because he's got a plan for them and for their lives. It's important to recognize that the source of the power here is Jesus, but that the power itself given to the disciples is not for themselves. It is given to them, but they are not going to be the ones that will be the primary beneficiaries of this power. They will be the conduits through which God's power will cast out evil and cure diseases when he sends them out. And so it's something for us, I think, as disciples today to wonder in our discipleship growth, if we just expect that we are to be with Jesus, then we're good. Hey, if I'm with Jesus, I'm good. I'm going to heaven, I'm good. But then we sometimes can live our life and it looks like anyone else's. And we don't expect much more. We don't expect power and authority, least of all, to be used on behalf of others. We want power and authority for ourselves. And so part of this summoning that Jesus has to the disciples, my sense, is that if you are giving them power and authority, it is also with the expectation that God is going to do something with that power and that authority. And so, for us, for you, what are you expecting from Jesus when he summons you to him? So the next part of the rhythm of discipleship and ministry is the ministry, and that Jesus sends. So we see that in verse 2. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now, these sound like holy words that sometimes we can just brush over and abstract them and go, yeah, 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 that's what disciples do. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's, that's what they do. They proclaim the kingdom of God and they heal the sick. But is that what you do? 
if you are a disciple? You see, Jesus is sending his disciples because that is the outlet of their empowerment to proclaim the message to heal the sick. This is the work of ministry. Might I add, it's the work of the church and not even just the church staff. But what is this kingdom of God? What is it that these disciples were to proclaim as they were sent? If we think of the Lord's Prayer, we pray it each week when we're together, and we say this, these words that, that somehow God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, do we really know what heaven's like? All kinds of popular images of heaven are out there. You probably have one as well. But let me just say that heaven is better than that. Okay? It's better than your concept of heaven. Because it is where God is. It is outside of time. It is eternal. We see that Jesus, when he is raised from the dead, isn't just resuscitated into his old body, but he's actually given a brand new body that's way better. And that for some reason, he tells us that we need to be pray praying that our life here is to express that which the life is in heaven, which is better than you can imagine. And so when we pray that the kingdom of heaven would come here, and that the disciples are praying about this and telling people about it, that they were trying to raise people's expectations. That God was following through on keeping his promises. And the way that that was evidenced was how the evil was cast out of people as demons fled and as people were healed of their ailments. This was, in many ways, just the peeling back of that barrier between heaven and the new earth and the new creation and how life ought to be. Now, it's very curious here that Jesus gives them some traveling instructions that you would not find in any of the travel manuals that you could find uh, in, on Amazon.com. He says, take nothing with you. Okay, that'd be a great book. You know, I've, I've been researching, doing some traveling, and all I do is get this travel book, and it says, oh, take nothing. Well, short book. Except that Jesus is saying, tap into the hospitality that's built into your culture. So in Middle Eastern hospitality, we know that people are very hospitable and that it would be expected that you would always have room in your house for someone if they were to come by. So he says, take nothing with you. Don't be distracted by carrying your stuff around or, or, or even that there would be something for a, you know, a robber or something to take from you on the road. But just go, and when you get to a place, to a house in a town, you stay there. Rely on their hospitality. We hear it as mooching. Right? Oh, we don't want to mooch too long. Except that that's what Jesus is telling them to do. Our culture's understanding of hospitality is out of whack in many ways. And so when we read this, we kind of say, oh gosh, hmm, these are like homeless guys. They just kind of need to get a room for a night. Except that they've been sent with a message and with power. And they're going to stay in people's houses. And they're going to heal the sick. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like this idea. I want to get out of my house as fast as I can when there's a sick person in it. Let alone be sent to someone else's house where there's a sick person there. I, ha I had the sickness on Monday. This past Monday. It's going around. There's something that's powerful. Some virus that's going around that when you get it, you're like begging God for mercy for it just to stop. There was at one point where my body was so achy, I felt so dehydrated that all I wanted to do was just take one sip of water, just, just, just one sip of water, except I didn't want to lose it again. And when I finally took the sip of water, Oh, it was the best thing ever. They should put this in bottles. <laughs> it's no fun being sick, let alone being with someone who's sick, because two days later, my son got sick. And he had it. And the poor kid, you know, just again and again, he 
And he wanted me to be with him, and he, he wanted me to, to, to help him and to encourage him, and I didn't want to, but I didn't his dad, so I did. <laughs> and he turned to me, and he, he asked this question, his eyes piercing through me in pain, and he said, Why? <laughs> Why? Am I suffering like this? Why me? What have I done? And I knew exactly how he felt. Last week, last week we heard a Latin le lesson about the word comfort, right? That it's with, it's Latin for with strength. Well, I want to tell you about compassion. That's Latin for with suffering, suffering with. That when you are with someone who is ill and you show them compassion, you are suffering with them. And when we understand that Jesus has compassion for us, his followers, we understand that he suffered on the cross. He suffered for us, and when we suffer, he is a God who understands our sufferings and who suffers with us in compassion. And that is who he wants us to be also as his sent ones, sent into communities, very living dwelling places where people are and where they are suffering, that we might have compassion, that God might release his power. You see, the disciples didn't just proclaim something, but they enacted it. And it's very curious because it just says that they, they went out. And there's, nothing, there's no information given about their journey. Apparently it was successful. But then we have this little moment of parenthetical comment, it seems, to talk about Herod. And we see that Herod was perplexed. Other places, other translations, it says he was greatly troubled. And it's kind of like the word that's used to describe it is kind of a word for journey with a particle in front of it that says um, it's n n negated. So it's as if you were on a journey, but then it came to a stop, and you were at some kind of crossroads, and you didn't know where to go, and you didn't know what to do, and you were filled in with some kind of terror or fear. That's what is going on with Herod right now, because he's hearing things about what's going on. What's going on? Oh, well, some people say it's John the Baptist who's raised from the dead. What? He knows what happened to John the Baptist. He was there. He saw the head. You can read about it in the Gospel of Mark. It's in greater detail. Some say it's Elijah, who never died. He just kind of went up into heaven, and he's come back. Some say it's one of the prophets of old who've come back to life. How interesting that for Herod, who is the leader of the Jewish leader of that region, that he would have all of these comments telling him about Jesus, and that they were using terms like being raised from the dead. He didn't even know who Jesus was. He didn't know that Jesus existed, except now people are talking about him as if he is someone else raised from the dead. Herod was the kind of guy that had to always watch his back. He couldn't trust anyone. He didn't know who would be coming from behind with a power play to, to try and take over. After all, he and his power were always tenuous as the Jews lived under Roman occupation. He had the power that Rome let him have. So he went out to look for them, look for Jesus. But then we leave Herod and we come back to the twelve. And they are coming back from their travels. And they've got something they want to share with Jesus. They kind of have a retreat planned. He brings them near the town of Bethsaida into the area of Bethsaida that's in the desert. In that, in that uh, barren kind of place that is uh, remote. And well, you never know who you're going to meet when you go someplace. 
We went on a retreat this weekend. Uh, Pastor Ken was there, I was there, Pastor Andy was there. Many of the Presbyterian pastors from our region were there for this retreat. And we met with uh, someone to learn more about preaching and teaching. It was a leadership retreat. And what do you do in a retreat? Well, you get away. So we went to a hotel that's in Green Valley. We have a grant that helps pay for this. It's wonderful. And we have food. And Friday, or it was Thursday evening, we were gathering together outside. It was a little breezy and windy, but it's on a golf course, overlooking a golf course with a very nice view of the mountains. And then there's also some residences right near where we were getting ready. My job was to help cook. Okay, so I was uh, cooking steaks and barbecuing different things. And uh, there was a gathering of Presbyterian pastors around us, around me. But then also there was a little party, including a quinceanera, that was um, a beautiful, you know, 15-year-old girl who was in her beautiful dress, white dress, out on the golf course. And they were taking pictures of her. So there was another group of people that were with them. And so all this is going on. And then there's this residence right on the end. And a, a lady came out onto her patio. She lives there, obviously. And she saw what was going on. She saw our group, and then she saw uh, the group out on the golf course. But it wasn't quite, she, she wasn't quite sure if it was one group or two groups. And then she became very worried. And she yelled, you know, the, the, the sprinklers are going to go off. <laughs> you know. The, the sprinklers are going to go off any minute now. She was really worried that the bride, she thought it was a bride, because, you know, this beautiful dress and all that was going to happen. And then she wondered maybe if it was us. And we said, no, it's not us. But anyway, the sprinklers didn't come on. There was no disaster. It was okay. Except that it broke the ice. We knew that this was a caring lady. And uh, someone brought a couple bottles of wine because, you know, it's the Presbyterian pastors, you know, that gathered. <laughs> and and uh, sh someone said, hey, come on, join us for a glass of wine. And so she came over and she began to talk to us. And then someone else said, yeah, we're a group of Presbyterian pastors. And she said, oh, yeah. I'm, you know, she was talking and she said, I, I go to a Presbyterian church. And um, in fact, there's another Presbyterian church uh, that I uh, participate in online, and I listen to Andy Ross. <laughs> well, Andy's just rolling up with his glass of wine. There he is. <laughs> no, he wasn't there yet, and he wasn't carrying wine yet. Uh, so we actually kind of began talking to her and uh, discovered, wow, all these different commonalities, and, and it was really a kind of a fun thing, and then eventually then she brought her husband out, and, and we were just having a great time talking. You see, you never know who you're going to run into. You never know who you're going to meet. Apparently, online folks, if you're watching right now, we're going to just show up sometime, so <laughs> be ready, and greetings, greetings to our friends in Green Valley. You never know who you're going to meet, where you go, and when the disciples and, and Jesus showed up, in Bethsaida, they didn't know who they were going to meet. Maybe, maybe they had some kind of inkling because it was at the edge of the Jewish kind of territory. And at this time, because of the Roman occupation, there were a lot of Jews who were upset and confused about what was going to happen in the future. And there were groups of people who had plans to do other things. Maybe, maybe they thought it was time to take power themselves because the power of Rome was not listening to them. Anyways, as we don't know exactly who this group, group of people were, but we can imagine there were some zealots among them. After all, one of Jesus' disciples was a zealot. And the zealots were, were kind of revolutionaries. And what happens with revolutionaries out in the desert? Well, you gather them together and then you, you give them weapons. Except that's not what Jesus does. You see, the disciples are wanting to process their experiences. They're wanting to have some one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus, except there's all these people there. And what does it say? That Jesus welcomes them. He practices that hospitality, the same hospitality that the disciples were to experience and receive in the houses they went to. Jesus extends to these people. They're just there. They're just out in the countryside. And he tells them about the kingdom of God. And he heals those who are sick. The disciples want to send them away, but he says, no. You give them something to eat. You know the story. So, 
some of you I know are thinking, okay, when we see these miracles in the Bible, do I have to somehow suspend my understanding of science in order to um, kind of get what is going on with Jesus? And I want to I want to say no. You don't need to suspend your understanding of science, other to understand what is a miracle. A miracle, you'll notice, is never Jesus just showing off. He's not doing magic tricks or um, kind of experiments uh, in order to fool or trick people or sleight of hand kinds of things. The miracles of Jesus are always to do what I was saying before, to reveal what it would be like if the kingdom of heaven were to break in then and there. If it were to bring and to make things the way they were intended or the way that they should be, that is what the miracle would do. And so Jesus simply pulls back that covering, that separation point between heaven and earth to provide and to satisfy, which is the final point that Jesus satisfies. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Restoration for Israel was what they were wanting. Jesus was giving them a promise of a new life, of the kingdom of God. The expectations of the zealots might have been, and maybe some of the disciples, that he would restore Israel in a political way, in a powerful way, that they should weaponize in some way and get ready to take back their country. But instead, he gives them bread. Twelve basketfuls even are left over. And the number 12 here is not an accident. Because there were 12 disciples, there were 12 tribes of Israel, we could even say that God is providing in Jesus Christ for the full restoration of Israel. He gives them bread. Do you remember chapter 4? Jesus and the devil. He says, man does not live on bread alone. Do you remember chapter 24? When he's with the guys walking to Emmaus, they get to Emmaus, and then he takes the bread, and he gives thanks. He breaks it and begins to give it to them, and their eyes are opened. Do you see what Jesus does with bread? On Thursday, we had our power lunch Bible study. Thursday at noon, guys, if you ever want to come by. And there were two homeless men who joined us. And they contributed to the Bible study, and, and at the end of it, one of them said, you know, whenever we come together, whenever I come with other Christians and read the Bible, and, you know, kind of like what we're doing here and now, you know, I just don't feel hungry for food the way I do if I don't have this Bible study. Maybe think about my own hungers, my own thirsts. He continued, and he said, you know, uh, do you have a brother? I said, yes. He said, well, make sure you tell him you love him. He said, I don't have a brother, but someone once said that if they had a brother, you know, uh, they were having a hard time with him. And, and I thought, boy, if I had a brother, I would say, tell him I love him every day. So if you have a brother, tell him that you love him. I said, I will. And he said, in fact, you're my brother. And I said, I love you, brother. And he said, I love you, brother. And he walked away. Who is this Jesus? Herod wanted to know. He's the son of Mary. He was born a human, yet he was the son of God through an ancient lineage. He was the Holy One. He is the crucified one. He is the resurrected one, not the one who just simply came back to life, was resuscitated, but he was resurrected as the firstborn of all creation. He was not John the Baptist. He was not Elijah. He's not one of the prophets of old, but he is the ascended one, and we are his, redeemed and loved. Let us pray. Oh God, help us to be resurrection people who are expecting something big. 
Give us compassion. Help us with our hospitality. Give us power. Use us to reveal your kingdom. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.